Have you ever heard about MLOps? Well, MLOps is DevOps for machine learning. Then what is DevOps? DevOps is a set of best practices, tools, and resources that all together create a mindset that how we can have an efficient end-to-end -end life cycle for our software development journey. Let's make it simple. DevOps is all about how we can start to develop a software solution. We put it in a staging environment, we test that, and if you're happy with the final unit test results, then we push it in production. And then we start to actually monitor that solution, which is in production. Being that said, now I have a life cycle, which is actually automated, and I'm ready to respond to any immediate results or any immediate feedback. And if I want to have a new version of my software, I can automate the process and push the new version to production. Now, if you want to know how we can apply the same concept, now this time for machine learning, which is called MLOps, and specifically you want to know how we can apply MLOps on Microsoft Azure, then this is the right video series for you. I'm MG, I'm a data scientist and cloud solution architect and welcome to this MLOps video series. First of all, I'm so thankful and I'm happy that you have chosen these videos to watch to learn about MLOps and how we can apply MLOps on Azure. For the first part of this MLOps video series, we are going to have a high level walkthrough and a little bit more understanding about what is Azure Machine Learning, which is a series on Azure that we are going to apply our data science workload there. And on the top, for the next part, we are going to talk about what is Azure DevOps and how we can use Azure DevOps as a DevOps tool to orchestrate my MLOps lifecycle. So now stay tuned and let's start with just having a high level overview about what is Azure Machine Learning Service. Hello again and welcome to the Azure Machine Learning Studio. So as we discussed in this video, we are going to have a very quick high level overview about Azure Machine Learning Studio. So this is going to be a quick high level walkthrough and each separate component or capabilities of Azure Machine Learning by itself can be a separate topic. So we will focus on have a kind of introduction about this service. and. Here's the main question before we start the MLOps journey that why do I need Azure Machine Learning Studio as my initial platform to start developing my machine learning journey? Well, the answer is if you're a data scientist and watching this video and you might have experience training your models and do your data scientist lifecycle on your laptop or your PC and you found it pretty hard to actually track all the steps that you follow in your machine learning lifecycle. For example, I, I confess that before I, I used to well, train my models on my laptop and my personal computer, and I, I used to manually actually uh, write down the metrics of my trained models, for example, accuracy, precision, and then after hundreds of iterations using different models, using combination of different hyperparameters and tracking them to see in an Excel sheet uh, which one was the best and I'm gonna single out that and and call it as my finalized model. It is centrally hard and challenging and the reason that we need to have a better governance, the reason that we need to have a better solution to track to make sure our machine learning model will be reproducible. Remember we talked about we want to apply DevOps or best practices for whole machine learning lifecycle, which means from uh, training, pre-processing, all the end to the deployment and monitoring the deployed model in the production. So that uh, lifecycle should be reproducible and we need to actually have traceability of all these steps as logged and, and also tracked to we, that we can later on grab those and start to dig in and to see 
what kind of codes we have developed, what kind of models we have trained, and what which models from just one use case has been deployed and now it's in production. So Azure Machine Learning Studio comes to the picture here. That is a solution for a collaborative workspace and collaborative journey not only just me also me plus other my teammates other data scientists can work together in a in an all end-to-end -end govern and traced and also managed uh, and monitored steps that i can follow to reach my production which is the machine learning model that i'm training and i'm going to use it later so this tool is a collaborative service and everybody as a team can come and start to train their models and start a journey and this tool is not only for our discovery but also that's a tool that we can use it to put our use cases our initial solutions to testing environment and even production and even monitor that model that has been in production so let me make it short and start to see practically what we have available here again each single option here can be a separate topic and whatever we are going to discuss today are just as of today so some of them are in preview maybe later on that you see the video there are more capabilities there or some changes but as of today that i'm recording i want to single out and in a high level of some of the capabilities that i'm sure as a data scientist or machine learning engineer you will love it so the first thing here that I'm going to talk about notebook, this is a very, very familiar tool for us as a data scientist, you might be probably very familiar with your Jupyter notebooks. So you will have a kind of similar experience here. Here, as you can see, I have a folder with my name and I'm the only person actually in this workspace. But if I have my other teammates in at the same workspace, you will see multiple folders, folders and each of them being named with the initial or the name of my teammates. So consider just me as one person of this environment and I have my notebooks under my folder. Let me create a new one. Let's say I want to create a new file and this is a notebook that I'm going to generate. I'm going to click on create and awesome. It will give me an empty notebook and I have actually put my uh, vision mode to dark. You can actually change it to color. I kind of like it better. It helps me more focus. And here I can type any Python code that I want. Let's say print hello. And it's cute. And you can see it worked. So you might question here that, well, what is a compute that just ran the code? You're not using your laptop. You're not using your PC. And, and I want to know what is a compute and if I can scale it or not. Actually, that's one of the main advantages and beauties of coming to the cloud and leverage these cloud computing based resources to do your machine learning. Here you can see I have a compute. I have created that before. And uh, let me show you more details. I can see I have four cores here, 40 gigabyte of RAM. And this is amount of this. This is about the cost. And the, the great thing about this compute is that I can scale it. So if that RAM is not enough for me or the number of the cores, I feel I need more speed. I have to quickly finish something fast, train a model fast. I can scale it with a simple click. I'm going to show you quickly. And if you want to, let's say, train deep learning models. And, you know, I know that it's very painful that you don't have GPU. So you can easily come here, create a GPU compute and just pay as you go. And when you're done, just shut it down and that's it. And you do not need to actually uh, to pay from now to buy a GPU machine for yourself that you might not necessarily use it all the time. So here you just pay as you use. Okay, so now you know that I have created a compute, I attach my notebook to that compute, I executed the code, it worked. And you can scale it. I want to emphasize that again a lot, that you can scale and I can show you the great amount of power you can create here. But you might question here, uh, I want to prefer to have my own IDE or I want to get back to that Jupyter notebook, Jupyter lab, or you want to actually use our language. You want to use your R studio. I'm using PyCharm as my IDE and I want to still be there. So the question is, can I still use all these IDEs that I, that I just mentioned some of them, but instead of executing the codes on my machine, I can execute code on this machine because here's the place I can scale it, I can have GPU, whatever I want. The answer is yes. And that's a very powerful combination that you can use, which means having your own IDE, 
but execute your codes here. Again, I'm going to show you quickly. And beside ID, the, I know Terminal is one of the favorite tools that I personally prefer to use that a lot. So the question is, can I have the terminal of this machine? And the answer is yes, with just a simple click. This actually, these computers are running on Ubuntu machine, so I can have my uh, terminal here. And so many well-known packages of data science are already being installed in this machine. So you do not need to do pip install, this and that, and, and some incompatibility issues that you have experienced probably on your machine. They're all being installed. Unless there's a very specific ML library that you want to install, that's fine. You can just do pip install and whatever you want. Or let's say uh, I want to show you that Git is already installed. You can clone any Git that you want. Or the great thing is that, again, uh, the kernel that is running this compute has already installed many data science packages. Let me show you. So I'm going to do pip freeze. Sorry, my keyboard is pretty loud. I have to change it probably. And here you can see the list of packages, some OpenCV packages I can see just randomly going around. And also, you can see that some of the Azure-based libraries has been already installed to let you actually connect to some other Azure services, let's say Azure Data Lake, which is in a storage that I can put my data there. And I can easily connect to that and get the data in. You do not necessarily need to use these packages. There are some more shortcuts to connect to those storages. I'm going to show you quickly. But FYI, these are some of the great options that is already uh, prepared and configured for you. Perfect. So I know that I can use separate IDEs, not just this notebook. I know that I can use terminal and I know that I can scale my computer and attach to that and also execute my code and you can save so on and so forth. There are some other details that can be discussed later on, but again, just high level information that would be, I think, enough for the notebook and how we can attach the compute. The other things that I want to really emphasize here, which is a very, very fantastic tool that it can really help you to save your time and be efficient in your journey, which is called automated ML. Well, even the term is very, very interesting. So let me quickly elaborate on what is that. As a data scientist, you know that, well, we have so many steps to train a model. We start with pre-processing, uh, feature engineering, feature selection, selecting your algorithm and you never know which algorithm is the best so you have to train multiple models based on different algorithms and you know better than me that each algorithm by itself has hyperparameters so you have to come up with a set of hyperparameter combination to train a model and, and track and see which one is better trial and error and as you know no free lunch we have to test uh, capabilities and availabilities and come up with the best answer here, automated ML will actually automate all that process for me, which is pretty simple. You can use Python SDK of Azure Machine Learning to code your AutoML. You write down in your Python code that, hey, I'm going to use AutoML. I want to do classification. I want to do regression or whatever. And this is my training data set. This is my validation. And I'm going to do, do, uh, do this, do that. And this is the primary metric I'm going to focus on to give me the best model, let's say accuracy. But also, if you don't want to code, you can just come here, click on create a new automated ML. And here you can say that this is my data set. Let's say this data set is on my laptop. I upload it here. This data set is in, in a data lake. I, I already created a data set that connect me to my data lake and grab the data and configure some settings. As I talked, uh, told you, you can use regression, blah, blah, blah. Just next, next, I'm done. It will retrieve and all the models that has been trained and give you the best outcome. For example, before recording this video, I actually was trying something on a data set to train automated ML models. And here you can see it has been already locked as a run ID and run information. This is a very important part that I told you will help us to have that traceability and the reproducibility of what happened. So let me click on one of them. Here's the details of that information. Well, there were at some point some errors. I, I fixed it. And here in data guardrails, it will show me what kind of guardrails automatically have been applied when I was using AutoML. AutoML. For example, it was checking whether I have class imbalance. It was checking whether I have missing information in my features, if there is high cardinality between my feature and the detected features. And it will see that, well, I have passed, but I have a, uh, a status called alerted here. 
Then in the models, I can see that, well, there's a huge list of models that I have trained. Not me, actually. Automated ML trained all of that for me with different hyperparameter tuning. And then one of them got the best results based on the accuracy, for example. And you can see there's an explanation actually being created here. So it will show me that, for example, which feature was the best and which feature was the most effective one. So it will explain actually my uh, model. Regardless of that, I don't want to put a lot of time in uh, details of each uh, capabilities here. But again, I selected a model. It will show me some more information about the model. The hyperparameters that model was being trained using AutoML. And in the outputs, outputs I can see the logs act actually of my driver node. I can see the the code, the, uh, the driver code. Uh, the environment that actually was being used, the conda dependencies or environment dependencies of the operating system that actually created that AutoML tools are all being logged here, my model as a pickle file, and the scoring file. And that's the code that I'm going to use, for example, to, to put that model in production, to say that if you want to use that model, this is the way that you upload that model and this is the way that then you can predict the model and get the data and put the data back as a JSON file so you can use this deployed model in production as a like let's say kind of API call through an URL and get the results back in the JSON we're going to talk about that but FYI these are the information automatically will be generated for you so under certainly more details can be also looked after here but just for your information you can also come here play around and see some other metrics and logs has been generated for you the other great thing that i'm going to focus on so just quickly here uh, let's say again i know rml and i know notebooks i can write down my codes but here i would love to actually use a kind of no code based journey to write uh, to create my custom machine learning solution from the initial step which is processing the data all the way to training validation and then deploying the model the good news is there's another tool called designer as you can see let's say you want to create a new one i can just drag and drop and do all those steps that you do right now in your machine learning life cycle for example i i want to get a data this is a data i created before the data was i think in my personal machine i uploaded here and then I want to do some transformation. I want to add a column, let's say, or add a row, so on and so forth. And I just drag and drop them here. I connect this box and I can create all my steps all the way to the last step. And then I can submit that I'm going to deploy. And it will actually show me the code that has been generated automatically based on this drag and drop experience. So that can be also a great service to be leveraged just for information I wanted to quickly share with you. And there are so many actually um boxes that you can just drag and do some any steps of machine learning life cycle that you know from again processing to all the way through different models for regression clustering classification so on and so forth and also computer vision and text analytics perfect so now i know the notebook to write down my custom code now i know AutoML to automate everything and now you know designer to have no code experience and as i told you all the way that you all these steps that you're executing the codes can be isolated from other use cases that you or your other teammates are working with as an experiment for example one project i was working on the abrics and then i have created an experiment here and if i click on that i can see how many times i, I ran that code related to that project why it failed or whether it failed and if i click on run id again the same information that i show you about logs snapshots of the codes and everything has been already generated for me here let's say i have then trained the models regardless of what kind of service i use to train those models now this is the time uh, that i want to register the model that i think is the best one because again we want to have a model governance machine learning governance traceability and as a best practice, I'm going to register the model first, and then I'm going to see if I'm going to deploy to the production or staging or not. And as you can see, I came up with one of the greatest models. I registered that, and here I can see some more information about the registered date framework, who registered that. This is also important for the government, so we can contact MG to ask actually, well, what code did you use? Give me some more information about this use case or whatever. And actually that can be tracked who created that code too. And some artifacts, this is the model of the pickle file and the data set that has been used to train that model. Very important. 
let's say, well, I think this is the best model that we can get so far. I'm going to deploy the model. So with just a simple click, although you can code, but here we just click, I can deploy and say that I'm going to deploy to a web service or real time. And here I can decide this is my compute type for deploying the model. If I want to run my model in the Kubernetes for, for having that service in production, I can select that here and then just click on next or deploy and then everything will be there and I can have some authentication also for making sure we know who gonna actually uh, have this service in production to use this model based on that authentication way that we're gonna define here. And when we deploy the model, if we come to the endpoint, we will see the list of deployed models that they are in production or staging and we can see what is the URL. Let's copy that URL and cut it through a URL or API call, put the input and get the prediction as an output. This is the way that we can leverage that model. Now the compute part. We saw that we had a machine. I, I ran my print, print hello using this compute and I told you that you can use your own IDE and there are some really nice shortcuts here. I can actually just click on Jupyter and have my Jupyter notebook here, just as simple as one click. And I can start, write down my code here, if this is a place that I'm happy there, and your code will be executed here. So you have again explainability to change it to whatever you want. Less powerful, more powerful. The same thing for the VS Code, I can have R Studio. You can actually use R in Azure Machine Learning and the terminal that we just discussed. And instead of just having one machine, you can have multiple machines working together called clusters. That's a very powerful tool that actually you can leverage. Let me show you as an example, I created this before. I can edit it to tell that how many machines that I want to have all of them as a node to work together to execute my code. This is the minimum, this is maximum. What is minimum zero, which means after passing this idle seconds, it will actually come down to zero nodes, which means I'm saving costs. Zero node means no compute. So again, as I told you, just pay as you go. Okay, I think this is good for now. Maybe just uh, the last couple of minutes, I want to quickly talk about, well, environment. Remember I told you when you train a model on your machine and you're going to say that, well, for perfect. I tested this model running on my laptop, got the greatest results, and you can deploy to the production. And you just send an email to someone as a, let's say DevOps team or IT team to, hey, please put that model to production. And we kind of see that, well, the model failed because the machine that you used to train that model was your laptop. And you have a different operating system, different environment. You have installed different packages. So that would be impossible to actually just dump the data model there and expect to be working because that's a separate machine we have in production. So we have to tell that what kind of operating system, what kind of packages, what was the general environment that I use to train the model and use the same thing in production to let the model work. So that's why we have all those operating system information packages called as an environment that can be tracked and registered here. And then I can use them to deploy the model within with the same kind of environment setting and packages to make sure I have a stability in my, my development and also production. And the data stores that help me to store my credentials to connect to different storages that I have to get the data so I do not have to put the passwords or credentials in my notebook because they are stored here. So I use them as a pointer. And data labeling, if you want to do image classification, object, object detection, you want to label the data as a user interface, you can just uh, visually uh, classify images, um, create circles, let's say, around the objects and label them and create your labeled data set. And link services, if you want to use some other computes as a source to execute your code, let's say Synapse, which is a very powerful service on Azure that has also a Spark there. So you can use a Spark for parallel distributed processing. Let's say I want to have Synapse compute or a Spark pool as a compute for my Azure machine learning. So you can link to the Synapse. And when you run your code, you can say that, well, I want to use Synapse to actually execute that. Awesome. So again, there are so many more details that we skipped, but we wanted to have a high level information introduction about Azure Machine Learning just to help you have a better picture and image that when we go to MLOps cycle, when, we, when we're going to talk about DevOps, when we're going to talk about, well, I have trained the model, I have registered the model, I have deployed the model. So now you have a better idea what we are talking about and you will have a picture in your mind that 
what does that mean when we registered the model where are the models where are those logs what is the scoring i just talked about the scoring python code that you need to tell how you load the model how you do the prediction to use it in the in the production right and uh do not expect to grab everything all the details from just just 20 or 25 minutes video i know there are too many details and I highly encourage you to go to Microsoft uh, documentation about Azure Machine Learning. There, are, there, there's always updated information about the capabilities there. But for now, for this MLOps series, so far it is enough to know and have a picture. That's the, the purpose. Have a high-level picture about the capabilities. So when we go to the next video series and the next video parts of ML MLOps, you will have a better understanding. And you might have less questions of what are the services and capabilities we are going to leverage. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching the video. And stay tuned. The next time, we're going to have a walkthrough. The same thing now about Azure DevOps. Now we have a better understanding of what is Azure Machine Learning and what are the capabilities there that we can utilize. Although it was a high level overview, but that would be enough for understanding the next steps and also to understand better what's going to happen to this MLOps video series. So for the next part, which is part two, we are going to have the same high level walkthrough about this time for Azure DevOps as a tool for orchestrate our MLOps process. So stay tuned and I will see you shortly for the next video in part two.